one of the many visionary acts of our first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, was a decision to establish a university focused on education with the task of producing the quality manpower needed for the education of the people of Ghana. So, and there could not be a better place to have the honor of hosting such a university than the city of Cape Coast. So, of Saberima, your city is where the light of higher education in this nation was lit inspiring a thirst for knowledge and drawing thousands from every corner of the land to drink from his fountain of knowledge. So, we owe it to the churches of, 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 for their initiative in establishing and laying the foundations of secondary education on a grand scale. So, from Infantipim and Wesley Girls School to Adesado College, Holy Child and St. Augustine's, the Methodist Church, the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, led the way in providing the best in education and in conditions of gender equality long before the value of inclusivity gained universal acceptance. So, this university, on whom we have to depend for the training of our teachers, stands as a crowning jewel of a city of enlightenment, from whose commanding hills and sandy beaches, millions of the best brains in our land have been molded, have grown the have grown the best talents who have kept the administration of our nation. So, it remains quite problematic to me that 60 years down the line, we are still grappling with the same challenges that informed the decision to establish this university in the first place. So, every government has undertaken a serious review of education system. The troubling fact, however, is that each review has either been driven by austerity or constrained by fiscal malice and not necessarily by the desire to achieve this, their stated goals. So we've had to live constantly with the contradiction between governments holding education as a high priority only for education to become the first casualty of any fiscal downturn. So, against such background, the mixed response to the recent free senior high school scheme has not been a surprise. So, the Minister of Education here will want to do more. By he doesn't have adequate funds to do what he wants to do. Every dramatic increase in enrollment affects the physical resources and infrastructure of schools, affects learning materials, and above all, requires a corresponding increase in the number of qualified teachers. Beyond these, as we have experienced more than once in the past two decades, every expansion at the secondary level has a huge impact on the tertiary sector. And yet, at no time have we seen an attempt to coordinate the implementation of any secondary, secondary sector reform with the universities. When at a stroke, enrollment in senior high schools are doubled, the universities have to brace themselves for an inevitable surge in demand for undergraduate studies, with no prior consideration for its effect on fiscal resources. Our universities are already bursting in, in this, at the seams, with rising student population virtually overwhelming fiscal resources and infrastructure. So, it should be obvious that important as the senior high school may be, focus on it should not lead to a misalignment of resources, nor should it become the focus of all attention in national discourse. Rather, we should recognize the necessity to, to look at the challenge of education in its totality. First, we may do well to re-examine the structure of the education system from primary, to, from primary to secondary to tertiary education. Is the separation between junior and senior high school working? What has become of the products of junior high school who are unable to proceed to senior high school? How functional have the vocational institutes become? How, how relevant have they been in the job market? Is the system providing for the critical middle level needs as we expected the polytechnic and technical universities to provide? So, secondly, we need another look critically at the financing of education. What resources are available and how they are allocated to the various levels to ensure equity. This is at the root of all the discourse. Education is an expensive investment. The expenditure on buildings alone is huge, but buildings alone do not provide education. So, learning and teaching materials might be available. In the 21st century, there should be no school without computers with other means to provide the basic ICT skills. And we should ensure our teachers are reasonably remunerated for the critical service they provide. So, so. 
Thirdly, we need to reappraise the content of education from pre-treasury to tertiary to see how far they go to meet the needs of, of the economy and society in this far-changing world. So, there are many areas of the system crying for updating and many anomalies requiring correction. The ongoing pri prioritizing of STEM education is a step in the right direction, but it is necessary to caution about the risk of restricting it to an elite class and leaving the broader system with no knowledge of these critical skills. So, for the sake of equity, we should ensure equal opportunities for all to acquire these vital skills in the education journey. So, education must lead the nation's response to the incredible challenges of climate change. So, if we are, if we are to fully appreciate the gravity of the threat to our planet and, and come to terms with what needs to be done to obviate the consequences, our education system must infuse in us, from the pre-primary state to the tertiary, the science and the knowledge which should guide our actions. It is, only, it is the only way we are going to make it possible for our communities to appreciate the necessity to protect our forests and our river bodies and restore the respect which our forefathers had for their environment. So, we need to reflect seriously on how we refocus education to guide us towards a sustainable world. So, I'm sure this audience will share the need for considerable reappraisals at the tertiary level to ensure our investors are fully aligned to the needs of society. It is right for the nation that we seek to maintain high standards in our investors, but it will be astonishing to demand higher entry requirements for some courses than the renowned Ivy League and Oxford, Osbridge universities in the United States and Europe. So and I, find it, I find it incomprehensible that we have deliberately kept the number of students Students at universities should admit for medicine and law, even though we have a huge vacancy of doctors and a burning number of students who have met all the qualifying standards. So, we have, we have the absurd situation in which parents of Ghanaian students have to find foreign exchange to send their children to Europe and other places to study medicine abroad, and then return to be employed by the Ghana Health Service. So, Assuming there are some impediments in the way of increasing the intake of students, would it not make more sense to remove those impediments to allow for all qualified students to gain admission and perhaps offer space for foreign students who will pay as in foreign currency? <laughs> Secretary of DCG, Provost, Deans, Directors, Members of Convocation, Stakeholders of UCC and Sponsors of the Special Convocation. Now my pleasure and indeed my privilege to declare this assembly duly resolved. I wish you all a safe journey. In 1971, you moved to Accra to continue your education at the Institute of Professional Studies, clan style among your people, as well, as well as encourage them to pursue arbitration instead of litigation. <laughs>
I promise to be a lawyer ambassador for my university. You know, he said that there have been too many reforms in education, but his speech is a basis for another reform. <laughs> so many questions were posed, and I was taking notes. <laughs>